How to Achieve Freedom, Episode 4. Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Shielding, and this is the podcast where freedom lovers explore and solve one specific, very important question. That is, how can we achieve freedom? Here you can learn practical, effective strategies to achieve freedom for yourself, for your loved ones, and to establish a truly free society based on the non-aggression principles. So without further ado, let's get started. I got a question for you. Why were the Ruby Ridge and Waco events tragedies while the recent Bundy Ranch standoff that occurred last month, April 2014, why was that a success? And what, can, what lessons can we learn by comparing these three events? That is the topic of a three-part series that I'm beginning right now. And in this episode, part one, I'll be addressing some major misinformation that's been floating around concerning the Bundy Ranch standoff and telling you exactly why I consider the Bundy Ranch standoff to be an overwhelming, big, fat success for the cause of freedom. So let's dive right in. Whoever is in power has great influence over how history is interpreted and passed on. So right now, if you go to Wikipedia, you're very likely to find an article that begins from a perspective that is biased in favor of the federal government. Even if they present you know, different sides of an argument. I just went to Wikipedia and I actually got quite furious. From the very beginning, it said, federal government owned the land, they purchased it from Mexico, and then they included an ad hominem attack against Clive Bundy. Now, the, the crux of this debate, the, the, cru- the whole reason there was a protest is basically it's, it's a, a difference in opinion over who owns this land, who owns the cattle on it, and who owns the Bundys. Are they free or not? Now, when, the, when, when somebody says and assumes that the federal government owns the land in the Gold Butte area where the Bundys graze their cattle. When someone says the, the government owns that land and they purchased it from Mexico, that's a ridiculous statement. Now, they'll, they'll even mention the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Yeah, that treaty exists, but that was not just a purchase of land. Let's look at what I interpret as the facts. Okay, at some point, Mexican government claimed ownership over that region. You know, if the federal government purchased it from Mexico, I'd like to challenge the assumption that Mexico owned it, or the government of Mexico owned it in the first place. Basically, they owned it by fiat. You know, the whole idea of fiat is you build a fort somewhere, and then you just claim that you own millions of acres around the fort. Or someone else built a fort and claimed a million acres or more around the fort, and you kill them. So now you own it. It's basically the same way criminal gang leaders split up territory. This is my turf. That's your turf. Only I can commit violence here. You commit violence somewhere else. That's the basis of this whole deal of federal government ownership of land. Is that that a nice way to live? Is that civilized? Is that legitimate? Even Even if you take the assumption that the Mexican government owned the land, well, how did the federal, how did the U.S. government gain control of it? And it starts with the whole idea of manifest destiny. There were people in the United States, I would refer to them as aggressors, who wanted to expand United States territory from sea to shining sea, all the way to the Pacific. And different people had different reasons for wanting to do this. Slave owners wanted to expand the southwestern territory of the United States because they thought it would mean more slave states. And if there were more slave states, then the slave owners would have more power in the federal government. And there were many people in the North who opposed this manifest destiny for that same reason. They didn't want more slave states. Other people believed it was God's will. 
You know, God had blessed this country and he wants us to expand it. Unfortunately, that means conquering other people. And that's not a very nice thing to do. Other people believe in this American exceptionalism. Now, I would describe this, I don't know, let's see. American exceptionalism is basically, we're the best on earth. (laughs) And our way of life, our, our culture is the best on earth. So we have to force it on other people. That's, that's the same logic Hitler used. You know, the Germans are the greatest people on earth, and that's why we need to invade other countries. The same logic they use today to invade countries. You know, these people who support the idea that the U.S. federal government owns this land and purchased it from Mexico, do you support war? Do you support invading other countries and killing people? Now let's get to that. Okay, originally the U.S. federal government tried to purchase the land from Mexico, from the Mexican government. That is. And the Mexican government said, <laughs> okay, they turned that down. No thanks, we'll keep our country. All right, we're not just going to sell it to you. Um, so, what did the U.S. federal government, what did the aggressors in the U.S. federal government do? These people who believed in Manifest Destiny or supported that idea, they decided to invade Mexico. Now, that's the Mexican American War. They invaded another country. They killed tens of thousands of people and they conquered their capital. And then they said, we're taking that land and we're going to give you some money because we just destroyed large portions of your country. Now, is that simply the the U.S. purchasing the land from Mexico? No. That's like me going to your house saying, I purchased your house. Only what really happened is I killed half your family and then I threatened to kill the other half if you didn't give me your house for some arbitrary amount of cash in my wallet. Is that a legitimate way to acquire property? Is that something you support, all you people who claim the U.S. federal government owns this land? All the people who make that assumption? You're supporting that kind of behavior because that's how the the federal government acquired that land. Only it's much, much worse than the analogy that I used, you know, for conquering your house. Because number one, it's on such a larger scale, you know, tens of thousands of people as opposed to a single family. Perished. Plus, whose money did they use to give to the federal government? It wasn't, it wasn't President Polk's money. (laughs) Okay. It was money the federal government stole from the American people. I don't have to explain this one to freedom lovers. Taxation is theft. You know that. So no, the U.S. federal government did not just purchase the land from Mexico. And no, the U.S. federal government does not legitimately own that land. And I haven't even begun to talk about what the federal government did to Native Americans. And if I didn't mention that, I would be committing a crime. The federal government committed genocide against Native Americans. Federal troops raped and murdered Native American women. They slaughtered Native American children and infants. They forced Native Americans onto reservations. They did that throughout the Southwest United States. Is that a legitimate way to own something? Genocide? Do you support genocide? I don't, I'm don't. i sure you don't, so it's a silly question. Now, there was some brutal violence between the federal government, Mormons, who moved to Utah, the Utah Territory, which part of which became Nevada later on, between the federal government, the Mormons, and the Native Americans. You know, there was violence. So I can't say for sure what happened specifically at the Gold Butte area of what is now Nevada. You know, it could have been, there could have been Native Americans living there. Or maybe there was no one living there when the Bundy's ancestors uh, homesteaded the, the area. So I can't say who legitimately owns it. Who are the rightful owners? Is it the ancestors of the Native Americans who originally lived there? Or is it the, did I say that right? I don't know, but uh, you get the point. Or is it the descendants of the original ancestors of the Bundys who homesteaded that property? 
I don't know because I don't know who was there first. Well, I'm guessing the Native Americans. <laughs> if they were there, they were there first. Um, but I can't say what happened. I don't, I'm not familiar with the violence that occurred in that region, so I can't say if anyone acquired it illegitimately or not. What I can say, without a doubt, with 100% certainty, is that the U.S. federal government does not own that land. If anyone owns it, it's it's you know descendants of Mormons or the descendants of Native Americans, most likely Native Americans, to be honest. That's, that's my guess. But I don't know. Most of the violence that occurred between the Mormons and the Native Americans was in you know closer to Salt Lake City. So yeah, like I said, I'm not familiar with what went down in this section of, of Nevada. But the point is, when someone tells you the U.S. federal government owns the land that Clive grazes his cattle on, and it's because the U.S. purchased it from Mexico, it's ridiculous. It's a fairy tale. It's a tiny smidgen, you know, the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's ignoring horrible atrocities against human beings. Mass murder, genocide, these kinds of things. And that's a disservice to anyone who is just trying to learn the truth. And that's why I don't send my children to public school. <laughs> and I love, look, I, I have tons of friends, not, I don't know, maybe not tons, but many friends who are public school teachers or who used to be public school teachers. And I love these people. They're wonderful, wonderful people. I'm just saying, as I said before, whoever is in power has great influence on how history is interpreted. So when you study civics or history in public school, you're getting propaganda. You're not getting the truth. And if you're serious about freedom, why would you send your children to a place where they're indoctrinated before they even have a chance to learn how to think critically for themselves? I can't do that. So, from this perspective, this is why I consider the Bundy Ranch, or one of the reasons why I consider the Bundy Ranch standoff an overwhelming success. Because number one, the federal government does not own that property. In other words, this was a, a confrontation between peaceful people who stood up against powerful, violent people. The Bureau of Land Management and their mercenaries were committing violence against the Bundys and their livestock. It's good that they stood up against that kind of violence. It's also a success because it was peaceful people remaining peaceful. If this broke down into a violent war, I wouldn't call that a success. I'd call that a tragedy. It was also violent people backing down, which is, it seems to be rare. I hope it becomes less rare over time. That's another reason it was, it was a success. And finally, no human lives were lost. The lives of animals were lost, and that is a tragedy. But the fact that no human lives were lost is a tremendous positive development. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's awesome. And frankly, given the circumstances, I can't imagine a better outcome. Message of the day. Lessons from history can help us achieve freedom, but only if we dig past the propaganda and misinformation to uncover the truth. So I strongly encourage you to do that and to share what you learn with the rest of us so together we can gain the wisdom we need to achieve freedom. That concludes this episode. In the next episode, part two of this series, I will be sharing the 12 important lessons that I learned by comparing these three case studies. Specifically, suggestions on how to improve outcomes in the future, how to achieve freedom while preventing the loss of human life. Such an important topic. Hope you'll tune in for that. Thank you so much for listening. Without you guys, there'd be no reason for me to do this, and I really enjoy doing this. So thank you so much for lending me your ear. If you enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you would add a rating and review at the iTunes App Store and perhaps share this with a friend, someone you think would benefit or find this information useful. 
If you want to leave a comment on this particular episode, you can go to howtoachievefreedom.com slash episode four. I do spend a lot of time on Google Plus, so if you want to connect with me, and I'd love a chance to connect with you guys so I could learn more about your values and how I can serve you better, do a search on Google Plus for Dan Shielding and you can find me there. Wishing you love, peace, freedom, and happiness. Have a wonderful day and look forward to a brighter future because we can achieve freedom. Thanks. Thanks.